So we could have, don't think you actually quite got to there, but you were sort of homing in on the, the trust element. But if you're standing in front of people, it's very much two-way. But also, whether it's standing in front of you, or whether it's writing, or uh, giving a video, there are two things that you need to think about the audience. You have the responsibility to choose words, language, approaches that they will understand. And they, on the other side, like you guys, have to kind of connect to what the speaker or the author is saying. And there's a lovely example of how this went badly wrong a few years ago. Um, some senior politician, I forget who it was, uh, had said something, announced a new initiative in some way, and <clears throat> got e absolutely trashed by the press, and all the social media and so on. And his response was kind of interesting. He put all the blame onto the audience, that's us out there, for not understanding what he was wanting to say. No. As a politician, he should have known the total responsibility for the failure of the British population to understand what he was saying, or wanting to say, was he did, it was his own problem, because he had chosen the words. He presented his ideas in ways that the audience didn't connect with, didn't understand. The person standing up front, the person writing, is the one who has the responsibility for making sure that the communication actually works. So you'll need to think about, are you writing, and particularly for the article and the infographic poster, for a technically aware audience, or what we might call a naive audience, who don't understand the technology itself? So if you're talking about 32-bit, um, or 32, sorry, 32 character um, passwords for Wi-Fi uh, routers and so on, you're not going to, if you're going to talk to your next door neighbour, you aren't going to start talking about rainbow tables and encryption and decryption and, and, and. You're going to choose words which actually make the problem very easy for them to understand, aren't you? Otherwise, you'll just go, and nothing will happen. So that's really what you need to be thinking about. So, you may need to think about this. I'll leave this as a task for you to think about over during the week. Maybe we can discuss it if you want to uh, downstairs in the labs in, in a little while. So we've got things like that you've got to, as a communicator, you need to be thinking about. Who is the audience? What's their background? How much do they understand about the subject? So they may just want a very high-level overview, just an introduction. Or if they're more technically aware, then you might, they might be wanting to come to hear you because you've got something new for them to learn about, that they really want to learn about. Whichever of those interesting, otherwise we all go to sleep, don't we? Awfully fast. I read something yesterday about attention span. A bit horrifying. And this is to do with how the internet is changing the way we think and do. Back in 2001, I think it was, the average attention span of adults was something of the order of 12 to 15 seconds. By 2010, 2011, it had dropped to about 6 seconds. So bite-sized communication is kind of getting a bit short. And then the author pointed out that the attention span of goldfish is around about nine seconds. So by 2011 or thereabouts, adults had an attention span shorter than the average goldfish. 
So that might be something you have to think about as you kind of develop what you're writing. It might mean that you actually need to think about a little bit of a brief summary. That because, if, particularly if you're standing in front of people, you can actually read their faces. You can see from body language where they're connecting, whether they are going to sleep because it's getting too technical, it's just going up over here, or you can see whether they're responding to what you're saying and staying awake. Now, when you're writing your dissertation, by and large, you are writing for a technically competent audience. Because your supervisor and the second marker, you hope, are reasonably <coughs> expert in the topic of your dissertation and in critical thinking, critical analysis, and research methods, and so on. Most of your academic output over the last three years has really been for the technically competent, academically aware audience, isn't it? So you need to be thinking about that. But if you're writing for SMEs in this article about things they didn't know they didn't know, maybe you have to think a little bit more about exactly what style, how much introduction on the technicalities you give, and maybe you also need a signpost. I put a little comment in the writing about this is a technical uh, introduction for those who don't necessarily understand it. So that when we're reading it, we can understand whether you're read, writing for the technical audience or the general audience. Now I prefer, in a sense, that you would approach this article um, more for the technically aware. So that means you then have to start thinking about questions like, what do they want? What's relevant? And part of the reason for using the LMCS template is it's, and six pages, is it's quite short. It means you're going to have to be incredibly precise and concise. So you'll have to use the um, so what question all the time to work out whether even a word helps to add to what you're writing. Or should I get rid of that word? Very, very important at the paragraph and sentence level. Because you're going to have to write, you'll probably find when you first write it, it's going to be too long. So you're going to have to work out how to reduce it. I mean, I've got a, uh, some work I've been doing for the last six months, roughly. And I have a target of 5,000 words. And I'm still... 300 words over the limit, and unfortunately, the people I'm work producing this for have a hard limit of 5,000 words plus zero. If it's 5,001 words, it won't even be considered. So I've got to get rid of another 300 words over the next week or so, couple of weeks or so. So that's why I give you a very, very hard limit, because I want to force conciseness. It's also, as I said yes last week, very, very relevant as employability, because there are going to be people out there who set you a challenge, it must be in three pages, or four pages, or whatever, or, or word limit. And so, you guys have found this quite interesting over the last couple of years, haven't you? Working to that plus zero, minus uh, two or three lines. But you managed to achieve it all. It works. So don't worry about it, guys. Bigger fonts. Hmm? Bigger fonts. Yeah. Nope. Change font to a different size or a different font itself, and it will get downgraded. <coughs> I've tripped over that myself in another paper once. So, basically, what we're saying is, in terms of communication, choosing your topic, choosing your aim, choosing your style of writing, requires you to think carefully about those questions, about what do you want to say, but then I want to say too much, I need to cut it down. The how do I want to say it and to whom all help you to get a really clear um, message. Oi, switch that off, Dad, guys. You're troublemakers over there. Just want to briefly go through a few ideas. <coughs> 
um, which so this is what I want us to have much more of, both in here and downstairs, is the sort of workshoppy, tutorial type of activity. Um, I'd like the workshops to be partly for where you can actually work together, bounce ideas around, but also so we can have, a, where it's appropriate, have discussions amongst the whole group to help sort of share ideas, share approaches that will bring everybody up to the best possible standards. Um, as part of working as a team, part of, part of working as a group, is all about helping each other. It's not as a competition, I want to excel and trample on people below me. It's all about, let's try and do the best we possibly can. So sharing ideas, sharing resources, your bibliographies, now, that's all going to be helpful. It'll help everybody to do even better. And that's what, when you go out to your jobs, Get, hopefully getting in September or earlier, you know, you're going to be wanting other people to help you initially because you're new into the area, you're more junior, less experienced, <clears throat> and you'll be looking to the to people you're working with and the team leaders to help you develop rapidly. And then in a year or two's time, you're going to be there as the experienced people and you'll be getting you know, people who are in today's second year coming through, perhaps coming into your uh, office, and they'll be kind of hoping that you're going to support them and help them. And so doing it here, in a sense where there's, it's no, there's no pain, potentially, no penalty, you know, it's kind of good to develop those attitudes, to help and share, so that everybody does better. And the thing is, I mean, this, I use this particularly when I was teaching down in Southern Africa, where in Botswana, for example, when I was teaching there up to about 2010, the whole of Botswana had 1.5 gigabit internet connectivity outside, internationally. This university into this building has something like two gigabits each way. And so my students had, if they had a very, very expensive 250 equivalent dollar uh, connection per month, they could get 56k connectivity. So they couldn't actually do much research. They couldn't download many journal articles individually. So we got them to work together to multiply their resources. So if, and we got them to work in small teams for, um, for the month after we went out there to teach them to do their research. And they would then share. They could each perhaps download four, five, six, seven um, documents. And then that meant each group had 30 odd documents they could use. And because of the way that our brains work differently, when we put our search terms into Google, Google Scholar, or the other sort of electronic journal systems, because of the way our brains work differently, we will use different sets of search terms. And so that's going to bring us a whole range of different resources. And so again, sharing those ideas about the resources, again, helps to get a wider set of perspectives. And one of the important things about this assignment particularly is I want as many different perspectives in each of those articles. So you can do a really good comparison between perspectives, between ideas, critical thinking, critical analysis. And of course, hopefully, you're going to enjoy yourselves thoroughly over the next few weeks in this. So, each time we meet, it wouldn't hurt if you looked at the presentation for the next um, week, had a little bit of think about it, maybe done a bit of research, looked at those little exercises, so partly for your own benefit, partly so we can actually have a little bit of a discussion. And these are the sort of things that we're wanting to develop. And as you are discussing, always remember you need to listen we have two ears and one mouth, so that kind of means we do at least twice as much listening to talking. But also, while we are listening, we need also to be thinking. We need to be doing that thing called critical thinking, comparing what is said to what you've already researched, to what you already know. See whether there's a disconnect, a contradiction. One of the things that I like best is when you guys say, hey, Richard, actually, 
I've got this research that says. Oh, okay. I like to learn from you. I mean, part of the fun of doing the, the modules the way I do them <coughs> with you guys is I learn as much from you, maybe more than you learn from me, because you do most of your learning yourselves. But I learn an awful lot from what you guys do. So, if you have a workshop, if you have a seminar, think about some of these things. Hopefully none of this is too uh, completely new to you, because you should have been thinking about this, doing these sort of things over the last three years. But it helps you to think about what we're doing over the next six or eight weeks. One of the very interesting things at a place like Derby University or when I was teaching overseas has been how do you judge when to make your point? Because some cultures have very, very short gaps in us speaking. And you have to get in quick. Or it's culturally acceptable to jump in suddenly, maybe interrupt people. Other cultures, it's very, very different. We're a multicultural university. We have a lot of overseas students often. And even within our UK um, population, there are a lot of different cultures who have different ways of signifying when those gaps are an invitation to add your con uh, contribution. And if any of you get jobs where you're traveling overseas, and maybe some of you will be lucky enough to have those sort of jobs, handling the different cultures is going to be quite fun. And if you really want a fantastically different sort of culture, you need to go to somewhere like Japan, perhaps. That's very, very different. This applies to everything you communicate, whether it's speaking to people, presenting, standing in front of people, or writing. That's probably the most important one. Be succinct. Keep to the point. Use that so what principle to check that it all actually adds to the argument, develops the argument. Don't put in any padding unnecessarily. Speak clearly, write clearly. Remember to put those definitions in on occasion. Very, very important. Don't start using those three-letter acronyms, the TLAs, straight off. Use the full uh, name in, a, in sort of word form, bracket, then the TLA, the three-letter acronym. And then you can use TLA on and on and on, because the, the audience or the readership will remember you defined it. But don't use the TLA first and then a sentence or two later say, oh, by the way, that's three-letter acronym. Or whatever. And there is this rather interesting book. I think I mentioned it last week. I certainly mentioned it in the intro to computer science a long time ago. It says the International Student's Guide of Studying at University in English. Interestingly, most UK educated students who've read that have said, wow, that's really relevant. It's not just for people coming from overseas. It actually applies enormously, importantly, and powerfully to those of us brought up here. It raises interesting questions about all sorts of things about studying and about being. Um, but it also talks about communicating and uh, things like that. So if you haven't read it, there's various copies in the library, and you'll find some interesting things which are going to be really, really relevant if you go overseas on, the, on a job or even travelling. It'll help you understand how people in other countries and other cultures actually think and do things. So it's kind of a useful one to use. It's not too expensive if you wanted to buy it, but as I say there's lots of copies in the library. So, as a summary. As we think of, you think about your topic, narrowing it down, there's some ideas here. Once you've got your topic and you're starting to think about planning the data you're going to put into your infographic poster and then the story that you're going to write in your article, I hope that there are some interesting thoughts here that are going to help you to develop even 
better articles than you've ever produced so far. Okay, folks, see you downstairs in a few minutes. <clears throat>